Amen. So Philippians chapter 2, the part I really want to look at there is in verse 19 where it says, But I trust in the Lord uh, Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own and not the things which are Christ Jesus Christ. And I read this uh, a couple days ago during my devotions, and it's just a, a passage I was kind of thinking about over here the last few days, and uh, just something I want to kind of look at. And I think there's a great truth that we can kind of learn um, from this passage. You know, there's actually a, a few things we could learn, and one of them is that, you know, the importance of other men in the ministry. I mean, Paul here is saying, you know, he has no other man uh, like-minded, and it, it shows you how important it is to have men that are like-minded. He has Timotheus, you know, ready to, to be able to send to these people when there's need, and he goes on later, talks about Epaphroditus, and it just goes to show you that a ministry is not built upon one man, but it's actually built upon a group of people. You know, and I, today, this morning, I think, was a great example. You know, I was running late, getting out, uh, getting out the door, had to take care, care of some things at Phoenix, kind of that are uh, unordinarily. And on the way down here, I, I had full confidence I was going to walk in, you know, five minutes to start time, and everything was going to be ready to go. And it was, you know, and this just goes to show you that, you know, we all have a part to play in the ministry. It's not about one person, but that it's about a group of people all serving the Lord. And, uh, you know, it just shows you the importance of an individual even like Timotheus. And Paul says, you know, he had no man like-minded. Now, I don't think he's saying that Timothy was like-minded. I think he's saying in the sense that he had nobody else besides Timothy, that he was sending Timothy to him. Because we know that Timothy was a man like-minded as Paul was, you know, when we consider verses like verse 22, where it says, But ye know the proof of him, speaking of Timothy, as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. So when he's saying he has no man like-minded, I don't believe he's referring to Timothy. I, what I think he's saying is, look, I'm sending you Timothy because I don't have anybody else to send. Because there's nobody else available for me to send to you to be a help, to be a blessing, or to help you in this need. And we know this is Timothy that he, uh, Paul says, you know, he served with him as a son, in the, uh, as a son with the father in, in, the, in the gospel. He said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, and so on. So Timothy was definitely a guy who uh, was like-minded like Paul and was a very uh, valuable asset to a man like Paul. And, you know, we kind of have a similar dilemma today. You know, maybe not just in our church necessarily, but kind of more broadly speaking, we're, we have the same kind of dilemma that Paul has here. You know, there's a great need today for, for men to be sent. There's a great need today for men to stand up and stand in the gap, you know, uh, not just necessarily in local church leadership or in even starting other, other churches, you know, uh, but even in, in the area of soul winning. We need, you know, uh, we need more people to fill, stand in this gap. We need to be able to send more like-minded people out and to, to fulfill uh, the, the needs that are out there. We have a kind of similar dilemma to what Paul has, a lack of like-minded men, uh, men to send. To not to say that we don't have any, not to say that we're like Paul, we have no other man. Praise God, we have many men and ladies and children and young people that are willing to go out and stand in the gap and, and preach the gospel and do that. But to some degree, when we look at our movement, if you want to call it that, as a whole and, and the greater need within our nation, there is a lack. There is, there is something that is wanting in our country today. And we are, find ourselves in, that, in, in Paul's dilemma in that sense, if that makes sense. And we see this even you know, in some churches. Churches today are, are lacking good, solid, local leadership. You know, uh, I don't believe we're suffering from that. You know, I don't believe we're suffering that in, in, in this location or our Tempe location. And we could look to uh, several other churches that aren't. But you know, there are churches, churches we might not even know about, that there's a body of believers there that, that love God, that want to serve God. But there is no leader that's going to stand up and take the reins and, 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 and lead the charge and send people out and, and you know, lean from the front, as it were, and, and go out and help people to serve God. There's churches that are lacking. They don't have a like-minded man as Paul. There are churches that are going to go unfounded. You know, there's groups of believers all throughout this country even in this world that desire to serve God, but there's just no ch good, solid church for them to go to. You know, we kind of, it's hard for us to fathom that here in America, but there are places in this world, such as even Europe, and I think we're going to hear a lot about it at the preaching conference coming up, uh, the missions conference, rather, this, in this, uh, this January, the beginning of this year, where there's going to be parts of this world that where there just, there is no option. You can't even find a lukewarm King James only Baptist church. You can't even find a, you know, a Baptist church that's just got the essentials right. You can't find any church 
They might even have Baptist on the, on the door, but when you go in, it's anything but, or they've got some false gospel. So there is a, uh, a similar dilemma that we share with Paul today, that there's a lack of like-minded individuals to send, whether it be in local leadership, whether it be in churches going unfounded, or whether it be in, you know, in soul winning, the area of soul winning. You know, there's, there's so, you know, we, we like, we sit back and we, we like to think about all the soul winning we're doing as a church and it's great. But let me tell you, as much as this church does in the area of soul winning, it's nowhere near enough when we consider the billions of people that are on this planet and that God desires for every per single person to hear the gospel and that, the, that the, the gospel should be preached unto every creature. I mean, is it really enough? Can, are we satisfied with the amount of soul winning that we're getting done? The amount of soul winners that we do have? You know, we're, we're working hard. We're doing what we can. But we, there's an area that's lacking today, and it's a lacking in having like-minded people, other believers to go and start these churches, other believers to, to lead in these churches, other believers to go out and preach the gospel, other like-minded individuals. And this is something that's lamented in Scripture. And we think about the passage in Ezekiel chapter 22 where it says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. So we know that God is holy and that God is righteous and that God punishes sin, that God will even punish nations, that God will even destroy lands, as it says here in Ezekiel. But, and we know He's just and, and holy and He has every right to do that. But God, that's not His desire. God doesn't want to have to destroy nations. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says, I, he said, I, sought, uh, I sought for a man that should stand in the gap, that would make up the hedge. But you know what he says? But I found none. And that's a sad case. And that's certainly not something we want to be said of us. That there was something we could have done. There was a gap we could have filled. There was a hedge that we could have made up, but we did not. And as a result, somebody was destroyed. As a result, some souls went unsaved. As a result, the church never got started. As a result, leadership never rose up. He goes on in verse 31 and says, Therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed on their heads, saith the Lord God. You know, God is going to destroy. You know, if there is no man, we can't say, well, God's just going to take care of it no matter what. No, God uses humankind. God uses mankind. God uses men to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And, you know, he uses ordinary men. He doesn't have to use the, you know, I think about Pastor Anderson's sermon uh, about Jonah, you know, a man of like passions, not a perfect man, but still a great man of God. And we see so many other examples of that in Scripture. God just using ordinary men to do great things. And, you know, we have, I believe, men you know, in this church and even in other churches that could stand up and stand in that gap if they so choose. And our, you know, so that is our dilemma. That's kind of just the groundwork for the sermon that, you know, hey, we are facing a dilemma. You know, and we always have, and, and to be honest, we probably always will. Until Jesus comes, we're probably always going to, it's going to be an upward battle all the way. Just because of the nature of man and, and the, the nature of sin and living in a fallen world, that's probably just the way it's going to be, you know, to some degree or another. But we should not let that discourage us and just say, oh, well, well, that's just the way it is and throw up our hands. No, we should work hard and we should consider ourselves whether or not we're one of those individuals that could stand in that gap. Whether it be out rocking doors, whether it be behind a pulpit, whether it be in some area of the ministry where we can find a gap that we can fill and help bring glory to God and save souls and, and all of that. And our dilemma, you know, it stems from the same reason that, of, as Paul's dilemma here. Paul says, I had no man to send unto them. And it's for the same reason today that we have that same dilemma. It says there in verse 21 where you are, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. That's the root of the problem right there. That's why there's no man for him to send unto them. Because is that not what it says there? He says, uh, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. And that's, you know, the, for, for all seek their own. Why is it, Paul, why do you have nobody else to send? Why is it only Timothy that you have to send to these people, Paul? For all seek their own. And we, we see even characters in the New Testament where Paul you know, says that of, you know, we think of Demas. Demas hath forsaken me, loving this, uh, having loved this present world. He seeks his own. He's not seeking the things which are of Christ. And really that's probably what we would entitle the sermon this morning is selfishness comes at a price. Selfishness comes at a price. You know, we can live a selfish life. We can live a life unto ourselves only, but we have to understand something. It's going to cost, it's going to cost something. 
you know, not only ourselves, but it's going to cost other people. You know, what if, what if we as a church, you know, and, and I'm just using this as an example because, you know, it's what we, less than 24 hours ago I was, you know, on the Navajo Reservation, but what if, what if we had an attitude as a church and said, well, you know, we can't be bothered to drive five hours one way and spend all that money. You know, we could do other things. We could sit back and, and enjoy our, one another's company and just, you know, have fun here in, in the valley or just do some door knock. What if we just got selfish like that? Well, you know what? There's 21 people that would have gone unsaved up on that reservation. There's 21 souls that would have stood before Christ one day unsaved in all likelihood. And, uh, you know, that's the same problem that we have today. Is the same problem that Paul had back then. That all men are seeking their own. And <coughs> not the things which are a Christ. <coughs> so selfishness comes at a price. I mean, even here in Paul's situation, think about the fact that it, when he was being unselfish, when he wanted to help the Philippian people, it cost him something, didn't it? It cost him his helper, Timothy. I mean, Timothy was a great help to Paul, and Paul had no other man to send so he said, well, I'll send you Timothy because Paul was unselfish. But it was because others were not seeking Christ, because others were seeking their own that Paul had to make that sacrifice. And it's a good example to us. And Paul, you know, and that's really kind of the theme in this chapter, if we read it carefully, is Paul is admonishing the Philippians to not be selfish people, to not seek their own, but to seek the things that are Christ. Look there in verse 3. He said, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I mean, that, th that's not about being unselfish. I don't know what it is. He's saying, look, you need to esteem others better than yourself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You know, don't seek your own. Seek the welfare of another. Don't be so absorbed and caught up in your own life, in your own circumstances. And I understand we have responsibilities in this life. There are things that we, in our own lives, we have to take care of. We have to bear one another's burdens, but it also says bear ye, every man ought to bear his own burden. So we understand that, but let's not get so caught up in it that we just seem to think that nobody else might ever need some help. That we can never look on the things of another. And he's saying here, do not look on uh, every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And really, what this requires, when you think about it, is a great deal of humility. I mean, it, 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 he says there, let, uh, in lowliness of mind, you know, that's, that's a humble spirit. That takes humility to be able to do that. And maybe that's why Paul could find no other man. Maybe that's why all sought their own and not the things which are of Christ because man by nature is a very proud creature. And it takes, it takes an effort often uh, to overcome pride in our lives. And that's why he says, you know, in lowliness of mind. That's where it starts. We've got to get humble and understand that there's, uh, there's needs that others have. And he says, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's not always the easiest thing to do, to say, oh, so-and-so is better than me. In fact, that goes against you know, everything in, in man's nature often. We're, you know, especially as men, especially as men who are competitive, we're always trying to outdo the other one. You know, it, it sets, even as, uh, you know, when it starts out when we're kids on the playground. You know, uh, who can run faster and jump farther and and do all the, the great things. And that's great. I'm not against being competitive. I'm not against that. I think that that's good. It's, it's part of, who, especially we as men, that's just part of our nature and who we are. But it takes a, a, an, a concerted effort. It takes a real act of the will. It takes a real humble person to say, well, so-and-so is better than me. Their, their wants, their needs, their, uh, the, the care that I have for them is more than for my own. But that is the example of Paul. He was esteeming the Philippians better than his own needs. Could Paul not have used Timothy? I mean, we see in other epistles where, Tim, where when the, in the epistles of Timothy where Paul's, you know, he's in prison. He's asking Timothy to come to him quickly and to bring the cloak and the and the and the and the uh, and, and, and the books and the and, and the other and the other things that he had need of. And he's imploring Timothy. I mean, Paul was a man who had needs. I mean, he was a man who had to go out and, and serve and work. Very busy man. He needed Timothy as a helper. But you know what? He esteemed the Philippians better than himself. And he was a humble man. And he was willing to sacrifice even his, his, what he called his son in the faith. And say, you know, go help these people. I have no other man to send. So it takes a lowliness of mind to esteem others better than themselves. And here's the thing. When we do that, you know, people hesitate to do this because they think they're not going to get anything out of it. They think, well, if I just esteem others better than myself, what am I going to be benefited from this? by sacrificing, by giving of my own self, by looking on the things of others. 
You know, what, kind, what will this thoughtfulness that I should have, what is it going to benefit me? And here's the thing, this thoughtfulness, this humility, this willingness to esteem others better than yourself, you know, that would be a great cure for a lot of people's depression. That would be a great cure for a lot of people's selfishness in life. A lot of people's problems that, that they have, you know, when it comes to things like depression or, or things of that nature, you know, it's, a lot of times it's because they're just being selfish. They can't get their minds off their own problems. They can't stop and think about other people. They're so focused on themselves that they can't stop to consider other people. And, you know, it takes an effort to, to, to be considerate of others, to actually take the time to look and consider another person in, in their situation. We, we naturally just don't think of that, you know, normally. We don't just think of the things and the needs of others. Often we, we forget about it. We'll hear about somebody's going through something in their life and there's some situation in their life or their family. And at the time when we hear it, we're genuine, we're burdened. We say, I'll pray for you. But then a week or two goes by and, they, and we go, oh yeah, I forgot. You told me about that thing you were, was going on in your life. How's that going? And nothing's changed really. You know, it's, it's gotten worse or maybe it's gotten better. But what I'm trying to say is, hey, you have, to, you have to be considerate of this fact. You have to decide that you want to look on the things of others. And it takes a, an attitude of, of selflessness, of being unselfish. And really that is the heart of the ministry. That is what ministry is all about. That's what coming together and admonishing one another, that's really the ultimate goal is to, for us to be selfless, for us to go out and be unselfish people. And really, if you think about this, it's the entire theme of Christ's ministry. I mean, if you wanted to sum up Christ's ministry in one word, it would be selfless. I mean, what, who could be more selfless than the Lord himself? That's why he says there in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which, also, uh, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's saying, look, you need to have the same type of mentality, the same type of attitude that Jesus Christ had. And he said in verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now when I was writing this, you know, I've got, let me go on a little bit of a rabbit trail here. Verse 6 is such a great verse about Trinity. It's a great verse that just makes oneness look stupid. As many verses do. Uh, it says there, who being in the form of God, right, talking about Jesus. So Jesus is God, right? He's in the form of God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So you can see how there's two persons right there. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense for him to, you know, what, why does he need to validate him uh, thinking it not robbery to be equal with himself? <laughs> anyway, something to chew on there, and it's a little bit of a side note. Maybe I should have just saved that for an entire sermon in and of itself, but think about that one. Yeah. So he said, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. This is the heart of Jesus' ministry. This is the mentality, the attitude that he had. And look at verse 7. He says, But made himself of no reputation. And that goes often so much against even people in, in ministry sometimes can get into ministries for. They want a reputation. They want to be known and seen of men. They want everyone to know what a great Christian they are. You know, and, and for whatever reason, whether it's just maybe it's just to be acknowledged, whether it's just to receive the praise of men, but some people will go so far as even to make their reputation known so that they can fleece a flock. So that they can preach lies and that so that they can, uh, you know, uh, sneak in unawares and, and, and become popular. I mean, you think of the Joel Olsteins of the world. That guy has a reputation. That guy's known. That guy's out there. And, uh, you know, that, that he's not seeking to make himself of no reputation. He wants you to know who he is. And he wants you to come to church so he can scratch your back a tickle your ear and get you to throw some money in the plate and, you know, and, and touch the screen and, and send a thousand. Or, or if you can, send, a, you know, two thousand. And things like that. But that wasn't the attitude of Christ. Christ made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And let's not forget who we're talking about when, when, we, when we read this. We're talking about God Almighty. We're talking about the, the creator of heaven and earth making himself of no reputation. I mean, if anybody deserves to have a reputation and to receive the praise of man, it's Jesus Christ. But here he is making himself of no reputation. Here he is taking on himself the form of a servant and being made likeness and made in the likeness of men. I mean, the condescension that he made when he came down and dwelt among men is far greater than we could ever understand. And you say, well, that's, that's a profound truth, and it is, but that's the mind which ought to be in us. That's the same mind he says there in verse 5 let this mind be in you, have this same attitude, be like Christ. Now, of course, we could never condescend to the degree that he did, but we could do it to some degree. 
We can condescend to men of low estate as we're instructed to do. Jesus Christ certainly did it. In verse 8, he said, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Again, that's what it all comes down to. You know, if you really want to be able to do this, to have this selfless attitude, to have an unselfish attitude, to be able to esteem others better than yourself, to be able to look upon the things of others and consider others and stand in that gap wherever it might be, you're going to have to humble yourself like Jesus did and become obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. So we see here that this was the, the, the heart of Christ's ministry. This was the theme of his ministry, the selflessness, this condescension, and the, the elements of, of humility and selflessness are found there in him. Now, if you would, uh, keep something there, but go over to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Probably in one of the greatest displays of Christ's humility dwelling among men. Here in John 13, he says in verse 1, and when you, when you get there, keep something in John. We're going to go back to Philippians, but we'll come back to John 13 a little bit later too. He says, now in verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And, being, uh, and supper being ended, the devil, having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Verse 3, and uh, Jesus knowing it. Now, verse 3 is a profound verse, and I think this is a key verse to, to really getting the depth of this passage. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. I mean, Jesus knew who he was. I mean, he knew how great he was. Jesus knew that he, the greatness that he had from God. I mean, Jesus didn't have you know, any, any uh, misgivings about who he was, that he was God, that he was supreme. He's, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, what does he do? He riseth from supper and lay aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that he, wherewith he was girded. I mean, what a scene. This last supper. I mean, Jesus, these men had to have known who Jesus was. I mean, clearly they did. That they, they, Peter had already professed, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they're sitting with him at this Last Supper, and they're watching God get up from the table and start to go about doing this. And you have to wonder if they might have scratched their heads. And we, we'll read about Peter, what he had to say about it. Watching God get up and put on a, put on a towel, girding himself with a towel, and filling up a bowl. What are you doing, Lord? And then coming over and getting in front of you at this table and washing your feet. He says in verse 5, After he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh uh, he to Simon Peter, and Peter said, uh, they saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? So Peter, you got to love Peter. He's just kind of objecting. You know, Peter's just, you know, we... I don't, want, I don't like to bag on Peter or any of these men of God. Obviously, he's a great man of God, a great preacher, did great things. But I believe he, and he's in there and he says these things, and we see so much of ourselves often, I think, in Peter. Peter just kind of objecting. You know, maybe Peter's getting a little hyper-spiritual. Well, you're not going to wash my feet. You know, I know, I know you're, the Lord, you're the Lord. You don't, you know. All, you might, you might, all, the, all these other guys might let you do it, Lord, but not me because I'm, I'm, I understand I'm so spiritual. Man, and Jesus answered and said unto him, uh, What I do thou uh, know, knowest thou not, knowest not uh, now, but uh, thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. You know, he's so holy, he's so righteous, he's, he's such a, he's a bit getting a little hyper spiritual here, I think. <clears throat> which is not to be, uh, you know, which is perfectly natural. I mean, he's a man just like any, anybody else. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon answer, uh, saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I mean, it's, it's, he just turns on a dime there. You know, when it comes down to what it really matters, he's like, oh, okay, well, in that case, yeah, go ahead and wash my feet. And you might as well get my hands and my head, too. You know, and you could just see it coming out of Peter, this hyper-spirituality. Oh, don't wash my feet. Okay, now wash my hands my feet and my head. You know, if that's what it takes, then I want to go above and beyond. Uh, above and beyond. <coughs> and uh, Jesus saith unto him in verse 10, uh, he that is washed need uh, not to, to uh, he that washed, excuse me, 
Verse 10, Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, Ye are not clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down again, he said to them, Ye know what I have done to you. Or know ye, know, know ye what I have done to you. And he's like asking, Do you understand what I'm doing here? Because Jesus didn't just feel like washing people's feet for the sake of washing people's feet. He's trying to show his disciples something. He's trying to show us something. There's something that we need to learn from this passage about how we ought to behave. The mentality, the attitude that we need to have as God's people, as Christ's disciples. He's saying, look, you know ye what I have done to you? Well, you washed our feet. Yeah, that's true, but there's more to it than that. He goes on and says in verse 13, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. And he's saying, you know what, you got it right. When you say that I'm the boss, when you say I'm the master, and you say I'm the Lord, that's right. That's who I am. I mean, like he said in verse 3, Jesus knew that he was come from God and that he went to God. He said, you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. <clears throat> for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So, what's the point of this? Is Jesus is showing us, he's giving us an example, he said there in 15, verse 15, that we should do as he has done to others. They say, well, that's beneath me. I can't do that. Well, are you greater than Jesus? Are you better than our Lord? To humble yourself and serve somebody else? To take the time and, and, and maybe look upon the needs of another? Look upon another and one another's burdens and help one another? To stand in some gap somewhere? to help other people, to be, live a selfless life for other people, you must be better than God. But that's not. But he goes on and says there, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he sent greater than he that sent him. You know, you're not greater than God. This is not beneath you. It wasn't beneath our Lord. It wasn't beneath Jesus to take an E and, and serve somebody else. I mean, what a, what a humbling act that is to wash somebody's feet. You don't believe me, let's try it after service. We'll get a basin. We'll get some towels and some hot water. You can wash my feet. No, <laughs> you can wash whoever's feet you want, I guess. <laughs> but hey, if you're gonna wash someone's feet, why, you know, I'll volunteer, right? That'd be a that'd be a very humble act, wouldn't it? It'd be very uh, it takes some real humility on somebody's part to, you know, especially back then. You know, they weren't necessarily wearing probably. I imagine there, there's a reason why this was a custom back then. We read about it throughout Scripture: washing feet, it's because they were dirty. Because they're out walking in the dust and you know, walking through the cities where the, other where the animals have been and stepping in who knows what and everything else. I mean, it was a custom back then when you had somebody over, the first thing you did was you washed their feet. Let them get cleaned up when they come in out of the, out of the streets. It takes some real humility to do that. You know, and none of us is above this. None of us is above, not necessarily this specific act of washing our feet. We're not going to start this strange custom now. There's no point in doing it. You know, it doesn't serve a purpose now that's not practical, but it's a good example for us that none of us is above doing something humble that would serve another. And that's really the attitude that we have to have. And that's the attitude that we see Paul preaching in Philippians. That's the example of Christ's ministry. That's the example of Christ himself in this pa passage. That the Christian life is one of selflessness. It's not, it's, not for it's not for us to seek our own. We have to seek the things which are Christ. <coughs> And here's the thing, when we're selfless, when we have this attitude, you know, it benefits both parties. It benefits both parties. I mean, this one, you know, specifically in this act of washing someone's feet, you know, somebody gets their feet cleaned. And they're benefited from that. You know, there's better hygiene involved. But you know what? The other person is probably happy for having helped somebody. I mean, we think about that probably, we could probably think of instances in our own life where we've helped some stranger out. You know, and that stranger's grateful. And we didn't do it necessarily just so we could get pat ourselves in the back. But we helped somebody out with something in some way, and they're happy. And you know what? We walk away and say, you know what? I feel better about myself. It benefits both parties. And it would cure a lot of people's depression. It would cure a lot of people's you know, uh, self-centeredness in their life if they would just get their minds off themselves and go help somebody. You know, sometimes when we get a bad attitude, sometimes the best thing to do is to go soul winning. And just go knock on someone's door and go see some, visit somebody who's got it worse than you. And your life won't seem so bad after all. 
and we both benefit. When people are selfless, both parties benefit. You know, somebody, we see somebody broke down on the side of the road, they need, their, they need a jump. I love it when that happens. Hey, I, I, I'm pulling, a few weeks back, we're pulling in from, on Sunday night, having, you know, coming back from Tucson, you know, tired, want to go inside and put the kids to bed and get in bed myself and the neighbors, you know, in our apartment, just a few spaces down, hey, can you give me a jump? I said, yeah, you know, and I felt good for doing it. And now I got a good neighbor, right? Now if I ever need anything, I can, I can go bug him. But when we do that, when we help other people, not expecting a return, you know what? We do get something back. We get something back. We feel better about ourselves. Because often people who get depressed, they're very self-centered. They can't get their minds out of their own problems. And we would just do a lot better if we would just go serve somewhere. Go knock a door. Go help somebody with something. So volunteer in the church. You know, I, I can't tell how many, many a time I've scrubbed a toilet in Faithful Word, humming a hymn. Happy to do it. Ran the vacuum just thinking about God in the church. Just trying to help out. You know, it makes you feel better about yourself that you're serving in some area. <clears throat> So that's the emphasis of the sermon, is that we ought to be seeking the things of others and seeking to help other people. Now, Paul said there, if you would, turn back to Philippians. It's interesting, the language here. The, the, we kind of see a, a formula of, of why it is that people are, uh, or what it means to seek the things of Christ, I guess you should say. He says, I trust, look at verse 19 again. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. <clears throat> for I have no man like men like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's. So notice there he says, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. So that, you know what that tells me is that when a person seeks the things which are Jesus Christ's, they naturally care for others. That's, kind of, that's what that verse is showing us there. Let's read it again. I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, and not the things which are Christ, Jesus, Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, excuse me. So if this guy, if he had somebody that was seeking Jesus Christ, he would have somebody to send that would naturally care for their state. When we seek Christ, when we seek Christ, the things of Christ, we care about other people, and it comes naturally. It's not something we have to drum up. It's not something we have to pump ourselves up over. When we're seeking God, we're seeking Christ, and we're filled with the Spirit, we're naturally going to care for the states of the, the, the things of others. We're going to naturally care for the state of somebody else. That's what that verse shows us there. Seeking the things of Christ results in seeking the things of others. You know, and because these guys, uh, because people are, are seeking their own and not the things of Christ, Paul had no man like-minded who would naturally care for them. Because they, you know, they were seeking their own, they were, they're not seeking the things of Christ. And if we seek the things of Christ, we'll naturally care for the things of others. You want to know, know if somebody's seeking Christ in their life? Look and see how much they care about others. You know, look how much they're, they're you know, the, to what degree. And I understand that we all have different roles in life. You know, we can't all do the same amount of everything that everybody else does. You know, the, the, the homeschooling mother of, of, you know, multiple children can't necessarily go out and do the, the great amount of soul winning that, you know, a single man is or, or, or somebody else. I understand that. But the desire's there. The burden's there. They, they help where they can. Maybe not in that area of soul winning, but maybe helping another mom or helping, you know, even their own children. You know, they naturally care for these things uh, because of the fact that they're seeking Christ. We can look at people's lives and see how much they're seeking the benefit of others and tell whether or not they're seeking Christ. In whatever area that is, and to whatever capacity they're able to do that, if they're seeking the benefits of other people, you know that person is seeking Christ, that they're looking for the things of God. <coughs> Let's go ahead and turn over to uh, John chapter 13. We'll close there. <coughs> Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Go to Romans 12. Go to Romans 12. We'll go there. I was going to try and wrap it up a little quicker, but let's take the time and look at this. If we seek the things of Christ, we're naturally going to care for others. They say, I want to be a selfless person. I want to stop being selfish. I want to stand in the gap somewhere. I want to help somebody. You know, I want to benefit from that, that as well. I, wanna, I want that, that feeling of, of you know, having helped somebody out. 
I want to get out of my depression. I want to get out of my, the slump in my life. I want to seek, I want to help other people. How do I do that? Well, seek Christ. Seek Christ. And it'll, it'll happen. Read your Bible. Go to church. Do the soul winning. And you'll find yourself seeking the things of Christ. And what you'll find yourself doing is caring about the things of others and helping. It says there in Romans chapter 12, look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. That's, that's a different kind of word. We don't throw that word around very often, do we? And what that means in verse 9 is that word dissimulation means you know, concealment of one's thoughts or true intents or feelings or character. It's don't let, let love be without pretense. Don't let, don't let love be, uh, you know, let it, let it not be, ha have a, a hidden motives behind it. Don't let it be this false appearance of love. Let it be real. Real, genuine love for somebody else. He says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Boy, it seems like Paul's reminding every, every, other, per, every other church of this. He says it to the Philippians, bury one another's burdens. And he's telling them here, you know, prefer one another, esteem others better than themselves. It's the same language. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, if you serve the Lord, you're going to prefer one another. You're going to seek Christ. You're naturally going to care for the states of others. And that's what we should desire. And go ahead now go ahead and turn over back to John 13 if you kept something there. We need to let love be without dissimulation. Let it be real. Seek Christ. All these other things will follow if we would just do that. Jesus said in John 13, after He had done all those things that we read of earlier, washing their feet, He says in verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Now that's a commandment, friend. <laughs> that's not optional. He didn't say, you know, you know if, if you like them, you know, or uh, if you can stand to do it, you know, you know, if they're not too ugly. Right? <laughs> I'm joking, of course. And he says, a commandment I give unto you. After doing this, after displaying this great act of humility and, and serving others and saying, you need to do like I did. You need to have the same attitude I have and humbling yourself. And he says, love one another as I have loved you. That can be a tall order sometimes to love as Christ loved. To, willing to, be, to forgive people for wrongs, whether they're sorry or not. Be willing to overlook faults and shortcomings and just love that person as Christ loved us. <clears throat> you know, and if we're ever struggling in that area with loving somebody else, we ought to just step back and consider how much Christ loved us. And, and if we could just get a hold of that, you know, we could probably learn to love other people. I mean, trying to love somebody as Christ loved them or as Christ loved us, you know, we should strive to do that, but I don't, I don't know that we'll ever accomplish that. I mean, as hard as we could try, could you really love someone as much as Christ loved them? We should try. He says, Love as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. How are you going to know if somebody naturally cares for somebody else? Or how do you know if somebody's going to be following Christ? They're going to naturally care for others. How, we, how is somebody going to know that we're, we are his disciples if we have love one to another? If we love the brethren? So Jesus here, he's commanding us to love one another. And if we do it out of duty, you say, well, that sounds hard. I don't know if I could, if I could get there where I'm just going to be naturally caring for other people. Well, do it out of duty. Just, just try and do it. Just make yourself do it for a while. And, and soon enough, it'll come naturally. As soon as it'll become second nature to you. <clears throat> you know, that's why there's some people you never have to harp on them about soul winning. They just do it. They just, because they want it. Because they love other people. They just want to go knock that door. It's second nature to them. You know, we've all had ups and downs in our, in our life as soul winners and, and self-included. And there's been times where I've had to just, you know, grab myself and drag myself out the door. It's soul winning time. And, and, and the flesh doesn't want to do it. But you know what? It, it's not very often I knock that first just a couple doors in and I'm like, why would I want to do anything else? This is all I want to do all day. Especially when you see somebody get, somebody get saved. You say, why did I ever think that this wasn't worth doing? So do it out of duty, and soon enough it'll become second nature. And what we see here by the fact that Jesus is commanding people to love one another, He's commanding us to do it. It shows us that you know loving somebody, it's 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 not just a, a feeling or a state of mind, but it's an action. It's something you have to do. It's something you have to purpose in your heart to do. <clears throat> so.
So that's the ser- that's the sermon this morning that we need to be like Christ in our lives. That we need to this and, and you know and the, probably the biggest area that we need to 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 uh, imitate Christ is in this area of being a selfless person, of considering others you know above our own selves, and being willing to serve and and to stand in that gap. Because here's the thing: if if we if we don't, it's going to cost somebody something. People are going to go without. Doors will go unknocked. The gap will not get filled because we're not seeking the things of Christ. There's going to be a hedge that has a hole in it in somebody's life, in a church, you know, in a community. There's going to be something missing, and to fill that hedge, to fill that gap, you know, it's up to us to do it, and we have to be willing to do that out of a selflessness, out of you know, not being selfless. We have to seek the things of Christ, and then we'll naturally care about that gap, and we'll step in and fill it. Let's go ahead and pray.